Welcome to Last First State Radio, featuring interviews with experts in dating, relating, and mating in midlife. And now, here's your host, Sandy Weiner. This is episode number 391 with Dr. David Simonson. Can social media ruin a relationship? Hey everybody, this is Sandy Weiner, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late for love and that a woman of value naturally attracts the respect and rewards that she deserves in life and in love. What is a woman of value? She's somebody who knows her worth and she shows up, stands up, and speaks up. Every week I bring you a tip on how to become a woman of value, and this week's tip is practice saying no. And actually, we need to balance our yeses and our noes, but we often say yes when we mean no. And I just got off the phone with my married daughter who lives in Israel, and she was telling me that she's learning to just say no to people who make requests of her that she doesn't want to do. And I'm really proud of her because when my kids speak up and really follow their authentic uh, needs and desires, that just makes me so happy. So my challenge for you this week is to practice saying no to something you're saying yes to and really check in with yourself. Before I bring my guest on, I just want to remind everybody that we have this free, amazing Facebook group and we would love for you to join. It is called Your Last First Date. So when you're done listening, go into Facebook groups and look for Your Last First Date and join us. We are a positive forward-moving group that is heavily monitored so that we don't have conversations that stay negative and victim-y and name-calling. None of that is allowed. We really want you to go on your last first date, and we do that by having positive feedback. So join us there. And now for my guest, Dr. David Simonson. He has been helping couples and families for 20 years. He understands the challenges that arise in relationships, and he uses a humor-filled approach to help people become more authentic and more emotionally intimate. He's been married for 25 years, and he has seven kids to prove that his approach works. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Seven kids. Wow. In 25 I, years. It's, I, t- I tell people that it's, so, yeah, seven kids. They're all my own and all my wife's. There's, there's no blended family going on. And it's one son out wow. of those seven. So I, he's currently at college. So I'm with a lot of ladies a lot in my of, life. A lot of estrogen there. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm definitely outnumbered there for sure. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's quite an undertaking. I had uh, four of my own, and it's um, it's a lot having all girls two. mixed. Two and two. Two and two. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. The perfect American yeah. family. That's right. We are all American. <laughs> Everybody behaves perfectly, and they that's eat right. three balanced meals every day. <laughs> that's uh, that's great. That's great. No, they're. I like I <laughs> I like what you had to say about uh, learning to say no. I mean, I think that that's. I was thinking, okay, that's like all about boundaries, right? Boundaries are are great things to have in oh, relationships for sure. Boundaries are everything. That's a whole nother that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I actually teach a whole course on boundaries with a co-leader because they come up for you know every single thing that we do. And I, you know, I listen to my son talk about his job and he works for Apple and it's all about boundaries. You know, a customer yeah. comes in, wants something that you can't do for them. And you've got to let somebody know, hey, this is what I can do. This is what I can't do. This is what you should be doing at home. This is what you can stay in the, here and do. And it's like just giving people that kind of information, whether it's in a relationship or in a, you know, client customer kind of situation. It's, it's like makes people feel at ease, makes people feel comfortable. Right. Right? It's oh, yeah, for sure. Such an important thing. All right. So um, let's get into the topic of the day. But first, I would love to know um, how did you decide to get into this business that you do? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I like how you say it's a business because there is a business <laughs> side to it, right? I am a helping professional, but there is a business side. Um, so a long time ago, um, I, so I was a police officer. 
um, for, for several years. And one of the things that I found um, when I was a police officer, uh, and I was young, right? So I, I wasn't kind of, I didn't have the knowledge that I have now, um, immature, right? I call myself immature. And so I was helping, I was helping people, but I was helping them into jail. And, you know, three weeks later, I'd be back at the house again for another, you know, domestic violence type issue, or a kid was out of control or something like that. If you ever watch cops or any police shows, um, you see that, like there's, there's cops will say, oh, we've run into this person before. So um, I, I was a single when I was a police officer, I got married and then we decided to go overseas and, and teach English. And when we were coming to the end of our contract, it's like, okay, what am I gonna do now? I wanna help people still, but I don't want to get back into uh, law enforcement. And so I just kind of stumbled ac across a counseling program, a licensed mar uh, marriage and family therapy program uh, in, in Seattle. And um, kind of looked into that and thought, hey, maybe this is something that I wanna do. And so I, I applied and got accepted into the program. And then two years later, I was had a master's degree in marriage and family therapy um, and then became licensed and kind of have been doing that for since 2000 ish 98 is when i started my program but then when i graduated i was, was 2000 and so i've been doing that ever since and along the way um i i found that when i'm out of when i was out of school i was thinking oh i need to get back in school and, and like further my education but then when i was in school i would hate i would hate it <laughs> and so <laughs> i started on this path to get a phd in family psychology um, and it was long because I had kids at the time also, and I finally got that in 2013. And so I'm done with school. Um, no more school for me. So that's, that's kind of the, the short story of how I got to where I'm at today. Okay. So that's interesting. So being a police officer, seeing the same mistakes over and over again, and just people ending up in jail and not really resolving issues, is that that was kind of the catalyst to like... Yeah, the, and see, like it's been, yeah, and especially in relationships, you know, seeing like domestic violence relationships where a, a woman or a man would say, you know, I know I need to leave this relationship. I know it's horrible. What, what's happening to me is wrong. But then they just couldn't, they couldn't do it, right? And mm -hmm. I think, again, that goes to what we just talked about earlier is boundaries. They, they have an inability to enforce boundaries. And so then, then there's this generational stuff that happens, you know, these kids see their parents being abused and then they bring that into their own relationships. And, and so I think that's partly what creates cynicism among, amongst a lot of um, first responders is because they keep going back to the same place over and over with the same people. Um, but uh, yeah, so I wanted to figure out a way to help people change that. And that's kind of what led me down the route of, the, of counseling. Mm, interesting. So now you can actually help people and not just put them in jail. I, <laughs> yes. I mean, I like to think I help people, but you know, I, I just last week I got a text from a, a wife of a couple that I've been working with saying, I'm divorcing my husband. Uh, I will be meeting with you alone this next week. He's not coming in. And I don't want people to divorce, right? That I, I, I'm not a big, I'm not a fan of it. Um, and so, but people get to make choices because they're adults. And so, you know, I, it's, it'll be an interesting conversation to see what led to this outcome. But I mean, it happens. And so I, I, I like to think I do my best to help people. But again, people get to make choices. They get to make choices, yes. And some relationships are really challenging more than others. And oh, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of times, you know, it's, it's interesting how people often will choose the same partner over and over again mm -hmm. with, because they, they blame somebody outside themselves and they don't see what their part is in the relationship right. not working. Well, one of the one of the things I do specifically with most most of the couples that I work with, I do a family of origin sketch because I think often what happens is trauma that a, someone has experienced as a child gets unresolved, and so they try to resolve that trauma as adults. And when I say trauma, it could be something where oh my dad didn't pay attention to me. I'm not talking like 
deep emotional yeah trauma is kind of a general word for there's something that happened emo that was an emotional injury and a lot of times people get married and it hasn't been uh, resolved well and so they try to resolve it in their marriage and that's where a lot of conflicts and problems come up mm -hmm. yeah totally i mean i, I do the same thing because i think we have to connect the dots between where you came from and the choices that we make in relationships because sure. they're always connected oh, yeah. and i think a lot of people like i didn't see it in my own relationship in my marriage i thought i was choosing smartly because i understood what was wrong with my parents marriage and my trauma but i didn't see the issues with my now ex-husband in our relationship i felt like i was making a logical choice that mm -hmm. would help me divorce proof my life <laughs> um, <laughs> i had no idea what i was doing i really didn't <laughs> but i but i thought i did yeah. so um so i mean i'd love to talk more about what makes a couple succeed and what doesn't but i also want to get to the cut the topic of today's uh episode which is social media and then we can okay. go deeper into couples and what makes them work or not um sure. yeah so if people are dating or in relationships what do you think social media what role should social media play in that relationship um I think the role it should play is very little. Um, I think often what happens with social media um, is that it's a it's a distractor. Um, how I see it often is <clears throat> for women, it's a way to, and I'm generalizing here. I'm not, everyone should know that. <laughs> um, so oftentimes for women, it turns out to be this place where they can um, get attention and for men, it's often a place where they can, uh, when they're unhappy in their relationship, they can find uh, people um, to connect, find people of the opposite sex to connect with. Um, and I think that generally social media, like it's just a thing, how it's used is what makes it good or bad um, in a relationship. And so you can have a relationship where they just, a couple takes pictures of their, what they're doing in life and it's very innocuous um, but where it gets kind of sketchy i think and where it's not helpful in relationships is when there's kind of some secretiveness around i think with any kind of social media when there's secretiveness around things and oh i don't want you to see this and i'm hiding this you know social media account from you that's where social media kind of uh, hurts relationships and so i think ultimately it again it's a neutral thing how people use it is is the problem and what and what they do with it and how they use it i think is the problem yeah yeah i, I agree with you it's i think we're talking probably about a younger demographic like 20s and 30s i'm imagining like where sure. the social media like instagram becomes much more of a distractor um people are on it all day long and now we have right. TikTok, and oh my god like my son works with a woman who dances on TikTok, and and it's like you know you're getting all this attention for doing these sexy dances and what if you're in a relationship and and you're getting attention from other men like what does that say right yeah i mean i think yeah i don't want to sound like uh what was that okay boomer right i don't want to sound like <laughs> oh but i mean there were i i still remember a day when i would just go to school and interact with people and there was no such thing as a cell phone right and uh -huh. i survived and i i think i turned out okay um again i get technology and i just don't have time for TikTok, right it's it i, I barely have time to do my own podcast and then post on Instagram. I can't imagine doing TikTok and Snapchat and all these other things. It's just like, I don't have time for that. And um, I think there needs to be a balance in relationships. And I've seen relationships, I mean, a common theme that I hear in a lot of the younger couples that I interact with is that there's one half of the couple is spending too much time on the phone. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think then social media, not just social media, but then a phone becomes a negative thing in a relationship. And I think 
you just have to be honest with yourself about am I actually using this thing too much? I think a lot of times when it gets pointed out, a person gets defensive. Mm -hmm. And then they want to point out, well, you're you're spending this much time on it as well. And to justify their time, I, I just don't, guys, let's not, just own it, right? Just be responsible for yourself and kind of step back and think, am I spending too much time? And chances are you probably are. If someone's pointing it out to you, chances are you are spending a bit more, bit too much time. And that, definitely kills relationships. So let's go a little deeper into that. Like why, why is that so, such a relationship killer? Well, I mean, I think, um, I think it's a relationship killer because when you're in a relationship with somebody, I think of a triangle, right? And in, in uh, the therapy world, there's this thing called the triangle and every point of the triangle, you put something. So at the bottom two points could be, um, the couple like A and B and then at the top point usually it's another person in a relationship but I mean in this instance it could be the phone right and so triangles are created to reduce anxiety so if A and B couple are having issues a phone is a great way to avoid those issues by like looking at Instagram snapchatting somebody TikToking, being on Craigslist what it, whatever it is and so I think um, people use phones and social media as an escape often. And then that's where inappropriate relationships often start because, Oh, look at this person, this half naked person, I'm going to message them. And then a relationship starts there and then infidelity happens. Um, but I think ultimately it's um, people use social media to escape. Some people use it just because they're bored, but I think when it goes bad, it's because people are using to using it to escape um, dealing with problems in their own relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we're escaping our own problems. And also I think um, we're disconnecting and relationships are all about connection. And so right. when you have a phone between you and people do this, I mean, you, you go to a restaurant and you see everybody is on their phone sitting next to each other. It's like, it yes. really blows my mind. Yes. Oh, yes. It's like, I, was, I remember. Oh, go ahead. I just, just to finish I like my daughter who's now 25, when she was in high school, she used to come home and want to go right to the computer at the time and chat with her friends, like, you know, whatever they were doing in those days. Maybe they were also texting. But I just wanted that 20 minutes dinner. Like, I'm making your favorite dinner. Let's just sit together. The rest of the night, you can do whatever you want. But just, I want to connect. I know. <laughs> Call me crazy. <laughs> and I would set it up, too. I would set it up in advance. What's, what kind of dinner do you want me to have ready for you? Let's eat together. And she'd agree to it. And then she'd come home, fill her plate up, and then run to her bedroom and lock the door. <laughs> and be like, Ugh. Um, but now we, you know, we have a very different relationship, but I remember back then just feeling like, you know, she figuratively closed the door on me, but she also emotionally closed the door on me. And I felt like I just wanted connection. Mm -hmm. So what we do when we have our phones is we're saying it's like stonewalling. You're putting up a barrier between you and that other person. Yeah, I often call it, so a lot of, I do family counseling in homes, and so a lot of times I'll be in home with, you know, a mom and dad and a teenager, and, you know, the teenager inevitably gets on their phone at some point, and I call it whispering, because I, I, I view it like, oh, who are you whispering to over there, because they know what's going on, but none of us know what's happening, and so I feel like, um, like, I agree with you, it's, it's disconnecting, but I also think how that is is like kind of what happens when we whisper to somebody and no one really knows what's um, being said but i agree i mean relationships are all about connecting i was just going to tell you so i was, can't remember where it was like a couple nights ago we i just got back from vacation and uh so we were out uh for dinner with some friends and so i got on my cell phone because i was bored <laughs> <laughs> And uh, my wife, I mean, she says, hey, get off your cell phone. That's not appropriate at, at the table. And I had two choices, right? I could either get defensive and like kind of, you know, defend myself or I could own it and say, yeah, you're right. So I owned it and said, yeah, you're right. And put my phone away. 
Uh, and it's such a temptation like it, it, for, for people, because if you are not interested in the conversation that's happening around you, if you're bored or, or whatever, it's just an easy thing to pull out and start looking at. And I often wonder, how did I keep, I can't remember, but like when I was in my mid twenties, how did I keep conversations going <laughs> around the dinner table when there was no such thing as a cell phone? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think self-control is a big part of having, you know, not being on your phone around people that you care about. Yeah. And it is, it's disconnecting. Um, I, I remember my father um, used to lead a Passover Seder for like um, these, this catering firm that he worked for. And we all had to sit there, the whole family. It was the most boring thing in the world. <laughs> so, and we're at the <laughs> dais. So like, we can't talk, we can't do it. And this was a long time ago, but I used to bring a book and I would read the book under the table. <laughs> so, um, so there was a way to do it without a phone, but, but it's true. It's like we, I think cell phones, it's anything with technology. We have these amazing tools that we can use for good and we can also <laughs> get carried away and become addicted to them. And, you know, it's the same with work. You know, we have a computer. I work at home and I could be on this computer the entire night. I could just yeah. from everybody or I could use it for what it's made, which is to have a home business and be able to work with anybody anywhere in the world. So yeah. it's, um, but I love that term whispering. I think that's such a great, I can really get the metaphor of it because it is, we can't hear what's happening on the other end. Yeah. So I never thought I'm of it that way. I'm still thinking about your, your story about the, the Seder and like <laughs> people looking like, Oh, Sandy, she's so reverent. Wow. She's always <laughs> just looking down. <laughs> she's, right, she's so reverent. <laughs> well, let's say irreverent is really more yeah, like, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's, I, I find to like at family events, having a phone really helps today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, anyway, so, so couples, you know, what's something that else used, that also used to come up a lot around social media was when to post that you're in a relationship. And this is more of a Facebook thing, but people used to say in a relationship and that was like right. big deal. So what, right. how do you feel about people posting that? Um, I, I, again, I think that people get, to, we're in a, thankfully a free country, right? So people get to do what they want, even it's, if it's really dumb. <laughs> but um, I think, I guess I don't have like a really strong opinion on that. I think that um, what, I, what I think is interesting is people don't seem to have shame, right? So a lot of, so I've seen a couple of times where um, a peop, someone's divorced, just newly divorced, and then like a month later, there's pictures of them with, you know, their, their new girlfriend or new boyfriend. <clears throat> and I think to me, I mean, I view that differently as a therapist because I know that divorce takes an emotional toll on people. And so, uh, and not just the person that's getting divorced, but the kids that are involved and, and things like that. And so when I see that online, I don't usually think that's a good move just because, um, I don't think enough kind of good processing has probably happened. Now I can't, I, I'm just taking a guess based on my experience of working with couples and working with divorced people. Um, so I don't think it, it probably doesn't apply to everybody, but I think in general, you know, a kid's going to see, Oh, mom or dad's has their new boyfriend or girlfriend who's already, the kid already knows that. And I don't know, I, I, I wouldn't do it personally. Um, because I, I like to be a bit more private about that kind of stuff. Um, but again, I think that that's, that's kind of the norm often is that you, you see people posting left and right about the new relationships that they're in. Um, the, the thing that I think is interesting is like these people are in relationships and they get out of relationships and then they delete all the pictures that were of this wife or husband or ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, which I always think is funny because it, it seems inauthentic then. Like you were ashamed of that person that you were just married to for 20 years. I don't know. It's, it's con it gets kind of confusing. Yeah. And so I think as a general rule, I, I don't encourage people to post um, 
relationship stuff online just when relationships are new um but if they're older if they're more long-term relationships i think it's more fine i think it's often what i find when someone first finds out they're pregnant and um when we first would find out we're pregnant we wanted everyone to know there's no social media back then um but then we re but then after having after getting pregnant and then having some miscarriages um we didn't tell people right we we would wait several we would wait a month or several weeks at least before we'd tell people because then it just would create some awkwardness people say oh how's your pregnancy and like oh i had a miscarriage and and so i encourage people to, i mean that's a social media thing as well that's not necessarily relationship related but i think it's just generally not a good idea to announce on social media a new thing because you could be broken up in a week a week later and so then i think you get viewed as kind of a foolish person mm -hmm. um and i don't think anyone wants to be viewed as a foolish person no i don't think so either um <laughs> but that, that's a it's a good distinction to make though that that the newness of it is uh, you know give it some time number one um right and you know i think People post way too much stuff, private stuff, I think, on, on social media. I think that you can't take it back. <laughs> you know, it's like out there right. forever, even if you delete right. stuff. And the other thing is that, you know, I once heard something like the sign, the best sign of a healthy relationship is no sign of it on social media. And it reminds me a little bit of like PDA, you know, like people who are yeah. constantly touching each other in public are usually not yeah. touching each other in private so much. <laughs> <laughs> you always wonder like, do you have to touch each other every second? And you know, what are you hiding? You know, and I think, I think that's also something to consider. But the other thing is, you know, consider your children if you're newly divorced and I, I Yes. We agree with you on that. I yeah. think that, you know, kids don't need to see just like I wouldn't introduce a new partner to my kids unless it was super serious. I also wouldn't put that on social media. So, um, and then the whole, well, yeah, go ahead. I can yeah, I'm, I'm outrageous in my, people don't like this often. Some people do. But when there's a divorce and there's children i encourage people not to remarry until their kids are up and out because i've seen so many horrible blended families where the kids hate the stepmom or the stepdad or the stepdad or stepmom hate the kids the bio kids of the person of their partner and <clears throat> i get pushed back from that because people say well i i want to have a life i i you know i, I just think ah. statistically it's not great for the kids to, yeah. to do that. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I think that part of the issue is that people don't get proper therapy. They don't, mm. um, they don't integrate families in a healthy way. And I know like my son sent my, sent his father a whole bunch of articles about how he dated after divorce. He was like, dad, you're doing it all wrong. Here's, here's some articles to back me up. <laughs> it okay. was like, um, cause the kids were really upset. He was introducing yeah. them too soon and to the kids, to their yeah. kids and like, yeah. uh, you know, having Passover Seder together with somebody he just started dating and right. And, and then they break their son. Right. And then and what they if they up. break up? Right. And then it's just like, we Oh, I guess we don't see, these people anymore oh now there's this new person and right. so yeah i think i agree i think that people need to be a bit more mm. contemplative about how they do dating after divorce when there's kids involved for yeah. sure yeah and that's a whole other podcast <laughs> I, yeah i just did a facebook live on this topic for my group because it's such an important topic and it comes up all the time. Like, when do I introduce them and how do I introduce them? And do I have them sleep over and when do they sleep over? And, you know, it depends on how old your kids are and all kinds of stuff. So, all right. Yeah. So let's get back to social media. <laughs> okay. Thank you um, for steering this ship. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. I'm not always so good at steering because I like all the side conversations. They're all interesting yeah. to me. Um, yeah, so people be mindful, should be mindful of their social media, that they should be mindful of, of how much time they spend on social media or on their phones in general when they're with each other. So that's if you're in a relationship. Yeah. I think another issue that comes up a lot is 
what people have posted of themselves, all the selfies, all the other people they've dated. And so somebody's getting to know somebody. They want to connect on social media. Now on Instagram, you can follow somebody easily. On Facebook, you have to friend somebody to really get access to all their photos and stuff. But all of a sudden you're seeing this person and the side of them and you're like judging the person based on how many bikinis this woman is wearing or, you know, <laughs> this guy is with a different woman in every picture. So what do you have to say about all of that? Um, so I, as a general rule of thumb, so anything I say, I always say it's just general, <laughs> right? Okay. I don't say this always happens. I, right. I have a big sign in my office that says no absolutes because I think absolutes generally are not um, a great idea. But I think if you go to someone's Instagram profile and 75 to 80% of the pictures are of them, um, I would steer clear of that person because I think um, they may not have narcissistic personality disorder, but I would say that there's a good chance that there's some nar narcissistic traits that they have. Um, if you go to my so I have two Instagrams. I have a business Instagram, Dr. David, and then um, uh, just a personal Instagram. And so if you go to my Instagram, I'm, I have pictures of my kids, of memes that I've made. It's very rare that I have any pictures of me because people already know what I look like. <laughs> and they don't need to see me like with pouty lips or... <laughs> <laughs> with duck wings you know I, I, so i have a i don't understand it i mean i know for a lot of teens they do a lot of selfies and i think it's just this cry for i need approval look at me and i just think i don't think that's healthy and so i think that if if you like somebody and that's kind of what they're posting a lot of is just themselves um I wouldn't encourage you to continue on in that relationship because I don't think uh, there's not a lot of depth to to them if it's pictures mostly of themselves. That's a pretty fair assessment. But, I, I mean, I'm not out there looking to date, right? So, <laughs> but but when I do look at an Instagram profile, I immediately notice if most of the pictures are of them, mm -hmm. and if they're very curated type pictures, right? Versus you know, I, I look in the backgrounds of pictures and see if there's a mess. And if there's a mess, I actually respect the person a bit more <laughs> than if it's like super tidy and everything looks like it's in order. Um, because I've got seven kids, so I know that that's not real life when everything looks all nice and neat in the background. Well, you have seven kids. I don't have any kids living in my, I mean, I don't well, have yours, kids so anymore. I was thinking, <laughs> as I was saying this, I was thinking about your background. I, it, it's completely different, right? Because you don't have an eight, nine, 12, 14, 16 year old living in your home, not picking up after themselves. Right. I'm assuming, I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I have grandkids and when they're okay. here, the house is a mess but they live in Israel, so they're not here very often. Right. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's, it's true though. It's nice when, when somebody's life is imperfect and they're not afraid mm -hmm. to show imperfection. I think that's what you're saying because I oh, think yeah. that there are so many pictures, like you were saying, curated with the filters and the posing and just all, all of this stuff, it just feels fake. And yep. then you don't really trust that this is a real person or this is somebody I want to get to know. Right. Yeah. So if a, if someone owns a selfie stick, I also think that's a, I never, I, I never understood the selfie stick. Cause you know, if you think about the stick, it's out, it's a, you, it holds your camera and it's pointing at you doing something. And I always think, I don't want to see that person doing something. I want it to be faced out so I can see what's going on around them. I don't want to see their reaction to going down a water slide. I want to see the water slide and what's around it. And, and so I've never, I was given a selfie stick as a Christmas present. I used it once and I just felt gross to use it. And so I, I never used it again. So I just want to reframe selfie stick here for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you and it's all about me, 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 me. And we have too much of that in our generation now. But 
I used a selfie stick. I don't anymore. When, um, when I started doing Facebook lives and things mm. like that on my phone so that I could keep it steady and hold it farther back. Um, and maybe go outside and do a, you know. Yeah, that that's not what I'm, t- I'm talking about. <laughs> um, hey, look at this thing that I'm doing, right? What you're talking about is I, I don't view that as a, a bad thing. What I'm viewing it as like, I'm on vacation. Hey, look at me riding this camel, right? right. And so then it's just a picture of them with a hump. <laughs> like, I don't, Great. That's great. I rem- I know what you look like. I know what a camel's right. hump looks like. Let me see the surrounding area. Mm-hmm. I think like a GoPro, for your purposes, which would take <laughs> yes, view exactly. Out. Right, right, right. So let's have a GoPro view of the world, and yes. instead of a selfie stick view of the world. You know, yes. I, I get what you're saying. <coughs> I'm just saying that not all people with selfie sticks are just well. Different. Right. So when I do my <laughs> Insta stories, I have it's not a selfie stick, but it's a stand, right, that holds mm-hmm. my camera and stuff. I mean, so. Yeah, you want to, want it to be steady. So that right. would make sense on why you would have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be nauseous when you watch somebody do it. Right, right. <laughs> That's a whole <laughs> other kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So um, what, what would you advise to a couple who are dating and have this social media issue of you know, one member, like you said, is, is on their phone too much, is on Instagram, on TikTok, on all whatever, um, yeah. and disconnecting. How would you suggest that they begin to deal with that? So for me, I, I would want to say what's, I, I would want to go deeper. Like, I think that's a symptom of something else. And so I, I would want to understand, is it, is it actually a symptom or is one person in that couple, that partnership just bored and it's they have an ineffective way to deal with their boredom? Because if it is just about boredom, I think then that would be a different conversation than I'm just wanting to emotionally disconnect from my partner. Um, Because if they want to emotionally disconnect from my partner, I think that's a more serious issue. So there's there's two ways that I would address it. I mean, the one way I would address it is if, if it's an issue for the person just to own it. I think, again, what I talked about earlier was has to do with emotional intelligence. You know, one person says, hey, you're doing this thing. And instead of thinking, am I doing this thing? Oh, yeah, I am. I should maybe change that, they, which is high emotional intelligence. They usually will, re- often they revert to like, well, you're doing it too, <clears throat> which then doesn't address the, the issue. It just deflects it back to the person. And then that inevitably turns into a fight. And so what I encourage couples to do, if something like that is brought up, um, don't get defensive about it. Think about what your cup, your partner is saying to you. And then is there truth behind it? And if there is truth behind it, then own it and try to change it. Now, sometimes people, um, they, they don't want to change it. And so if they don't want to change it and they want to stay on their phone, then that facilitates a whole nother conversation about maybe this is not a relationship that you want to be in. Um, cause if you're feeling disconnected from your partner and your partner doesn't really care, why would you want to be in a relationship like that? Yeah. Um, but if it's simply about boredom, like, Oh, there's nothing else to do. I was just on my phone. Um, I, I would, ha- I would have a conversation with them like, well, there is other, there are other things to do. You guys could go on a walk. You guys could, um, spend time with your children. You could do this, you could do that. Um, and so I think it, a lot of it depends on the reason behind the um, use of, of the social media or the electronic device. It could be video games, you know, um, mm-hmm. Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever. Yeah, and uh, Apple just came out with the Apple Arcade, which is oh. going to suck a lot of people down that hole. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have my not son, heard that yet. Yeah, my son works for Apple, so he, he got access to it and he shows me this cool game and it's like, how many hours are you? No. He's very yeah. good about moderating it, but it's it is easy to get sucked down that path, man. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm a oh, worst yeah. with friends player and I can I can ignore everybody and just catch up on my games until I realize that there are people around <laughs> me so I uh, yes. just as you know you have to be conscious about yeah. what you're doing and why you're doing it um, all right so David um, 
I always ask my, my guests this final question, which is what is one final word of advice that you have for anybody who wants to go on their last first date? Um, pay attention to red flags. I think that um, a lot of times couples that I run into will talk about 10 red flags that were there before they got married, but they thought, eh, they thought they were yellow flags, but I hear them and I think, no, those were red flags. And they get married anyways. And so my biggest encouragement to people is if there is a yellow flag in your relationship or a red flag, but especially if there's a yellow flag and you're hoping to maybe get married to this person or, or partner up with them long term, seek out some couples counseling because a third party can really help you drill down and nail if those are actual issues that need to be addressed or that are deal breakers in a relationship. Excellent advice. As somebody who has pushed red flags under carpets many times <laughs> until I couldn't walk anymore because I was tripping over them, I totally <laughs> hear you. <laughs> okay. I think often we, we excuse the inexcusable and yep. those yellow flags are usually red flags. Right. I think a lot of times what happens is we second guess ourselves. And um, like what you said with at the start is like, we say yes when we should be saying no. And I think our emotions cloud our judgment when our fact, when our brain actually is saying, this is not a relationship you should be in. But then your emotions tell you, oh, but he's so nice or she's just so pleasant. And oh, this isn't that big of a deal. I can overlook this. Mm -hmm. And then you're two years in and you think, what was I thinking? Yeah, <laughs> Why so am I true. in this relationship? Yeah, I, I love watching these reality shows on TV where people are coupling up or getting back together with an ex or whatever this yeah. the show is. And you see like the issues are so clear from yes. the outside looking in. You see how they argue one is defensive and there was just this show called love is blind um, which was big on netflix the last couple of weeks and there's this one couple where she was on social media as soon as they gave them their phones back and he called her on and he's like what he really wasn't saying is i feel like you're ignoring me and i feel sad and mm -hmm. instead he's just accusing and she yep. gets defensive and shuts down and says but you do that but just like what you said yeah, and you're going, yeah. this isn't going to last because they don't know how to argue at all. They have no That's, idea how to resolve conflict. That is, that is accurate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to steer clear of that show. That'll just be frustrating to watch. <laughs> it is. But it's, you can't stop watching it. It's so addictive. It's like so, you can see everything unfolding and you still can't stop. It's like watching watching the accident happen on the side. Yeah, of it's like a tr you think, okay, there's an accident about to happen. Oh, it's happening. Wow, it's look at that. Right, I know. Oh my God, uh, look, I can't stop looking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a great conversation. And I, I just think people need to know social media can be a good <laughs> thing and it can be a total disaster. And you get to choose how you use it. And yep choose wisely yep so david tell tell everybody how they can find you um you can find me lots of ways if you just google uh dr david simonson um i'll come up i'll also come up with there's a rabbi named david simonson <laughs> who is passed on and there is a uh, murderer in oregon oh. named david simonson wow. so <laughs> you'll find me <laughs> i think i come up first usually um you're you can go dead. on Instagram. You're not uh, dead if you're not a murderer. Yeah, I know. It's great. <laughs> um, you can go on uh, Instagram and just search Dr. David Simonson or on Facebook. Um, it's Ask Doc David, I think, is my Facebook page. But Google, I Google's your friend. If, if you find me, and it'll give you my website, and then everything is on my website, my podcast and YouTube channel, and et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. All of this will be in the show notes when I post this to my blog, lastfirstdate.com. And uh, I want to thank all our listeners today for listening. And please don't forget to check out Your Last First Date on Facebook and join us there if you haven't already. And we hope you go on Your Last First Date very soon. Have a great day.